Acts, the 10th chapter, and the 38th verse, we read how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Well, here in John's Gospel, the 14th chapter and the 9th verse, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Now, I want to talk to you where sickness comes from. Because, you see, as long as you think it's a blessing from heaven, you're going to entertain it and receive it and clasp it to your bosom. But we need to know that sickness and disease does not come from God, and it does not come from heaven, because there isn't any up there. And so if there's no sickness in heaven, and the Bible plainly said it, there is none there, then sickness can't come from heaven. Well, if it doesn't come from heaven and from God, then I don't want it. I don't know about you. The Bible said every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. Then sickness can't be a gift that God sent you. And then sickness can't be good. We read here how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and making people sick. Oh no, that wasn't the good that he did. He went about doing good and healing the sick. Thank God our God is a good God. And our God is a healing God. Now I realize and recognize... For those who are unacquainted with the Scriptures, because it was difficult for me to see this one day. It is difficult for one that's unacquainted with the Scriptures to realize that the laws that are governing the earth today very largely came into being with the fall of man. That is, when Adam sinned and with the curse upon the earth. And because men do not understand that, then they accuse God of the accidents that take place. They accuse accuse God of the sickness and the death of their loved one. They accuse God of the storms and catastrophes of earthquakes and floods that continually occur. And even in our insurance policy, sometimes it's called an act of God. Makes me mad every time I read it. Nobody but an ignoramus would ever think so. That's not an act of God because it's not good. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. We could say from the Father above. With whom there is no variable in his neither shadow of turning. He hasn't changed. He's the same now as he was then. There's not even a shadow of turning with it. Now all of these natural laws as we understand them were set aside by Jesus whenever it was necessary to bless humanity. Now keep in mind the text. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the will of God in action. I like to say it like that. What is God's will? Well, you see, he said, I came not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Then Jesus was and is the will of God. He was doing the will of God. Well, then when he set aside these laws of nature to bless humanity, if these laws were laws of God, then he was working against himself. You know, when the storm was on, the disciples was in the ship, and Jesus had got on board with them and said, let us go over to the other the side. And then he laid down the hindy part of the ship was asleep on a pillar and there rose a great storm of wind so that the waves now beat into the ship and the disciples awakened him and said Master, carest thou not that we perish? But you see, Jesus was a man of faith and he, when he got on board that thing, he said, let us pass over to the other side. He didn't say let's go halfway and sink. <laughs> he said, let's pass over to the other side. And Jesus had preached, you can have what you say. These disciples heard him preach that. He he said, Whosoever shall say, and not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he says shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. And so he said, Let us pass over to the other side. He said it. He believes it. He just lies down. Don't sleep. Don't care how much the winds are blowing. Don't care how much the waves are beating into the boat. Bless God. He said, Let's pass over to the other side. But the disciples
disciples became fearful. And they awakened him and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And the Bible said that Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. He said, Peace be still. He wasn't rebuking something that God was doing because he was God. Peace be still. And there's a great calm. But then he rebuked these disciples. O oh, ye of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Where is your faith? Again and again we see him. I just use the one illustration. Setting aside the laws of nature whenever it was necessary to bless humanity. I read where John Alexander Dow we said and remember that he crossed the Atlantic and the Pacific back prior to 1900 when we didn't have all of the instruments of navigation that we have today. Because you see he was born in Scotland and graduated from the University of Edinburgh as a lawyer and then felt called to preach and then back to the school and graduated from the theological seminary and was a congregationist minister but then received about 1875 light on divine healing the power of God and faith and began to preach it. But he said I've crossed the ocean 14 times. He said almost every one of them the storms have arisen. And all 14 times without exception I just stood on board the ship and said peace be still and it sea. You see he recognized the truth that that was not God in the storm but that these laws came into existence because Satan became the God of this world. All of these natural laws let me say it again as we understand them were set aside by Jesus whenever it's necessary to bless humanity. They came with the fall. Their author is Satan. And when Satan is finally eliminated from human contact or rather from the earth, all of these laws will stop functioning. The Bible plainly said that when Satan is bound, you know, and put there in the bottom of his pit, that there shall be nothing that shall hurt or destroy. Why, it ought to be obvious where these things come from. But now I can understand why people are perplexed, why they're confused. Because, you see, we haven't taken time to get into the Word for ourselves. We just accepted what somebody else said about it. We accepted what some unbelieving minister said about it. Or we accepted what our church taught about it. Instead of seeing what the New Testament, the Word of God, the Bible, actually had to say on the subject. Many of them never examined the Bible on these subjects. I know even myself, as a Baptist boy, raised up from the deathbed. But, you see, I didn't know what I know now. I don't only received one little glimpse of light. I had just seen that Mark eleven twenty four said, What things ever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and ye shall have them. I didn't know healing was in the atonement. I didn't know himself took my infirmities and bare my sicknesses. I didn't know by whose stripes ye were healed. I didn't know surely it borne our sicknesses and carried our diseases yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God. I didn't know those verses in the Bible and if I read them they didn't Red sir on me. I didn't know that Satan was the author of sickness and disease. All I knew was that I was sick all my life. All I knew was that I never did run like other little children and play. That I had a deformed heart. That I never was well. That I never had a good night's rest. All I know was that I became bedfast when I was 15 years old and stayed there for 16 months. Five doctors said I had to die. I know what it means to be there, but I didn't know why I was there. I know what some people People tried to tell me, well now, that's just the will of God for you, you know. So just be patient. Even the unbelieving preacher came and patted my hand and said, just be patient, my boy. In a few more days, it'll all be over. And that's the best he could bring. No, I just saw that God hears and answers prayer. I just saw that the prayer of faith worked. That's just one way of being healed. Well, thank God for and I prayed that prayer of faith for myself just a matter of six days before my 17th birthday and walked off of that bed of affliction and sickness. But remember now, all I saw was that the prayer of faith works. I didn't know where sickness comes from. I didn't know Satan was the author of sickness. And you know, there remained a fear in my life even though I preached, even though as a Baptist pastor I laid hands on the sick and saw them healed and anointed them with oil and saw them healed and even after I was baptized with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues and received the left foot of fellowship from among the Baptists and even changed over and started pastoring a full gospel church and pastored for three or four years and there was out the evangelistic work right here in the state of Texas and I still didn't know where sickness came from and there was a fear. I don't know whether you 
you've ever been bed fast for 16 months or not. You try staying in bed sometimes 16 long months and you'll find out it's a mighty long time. I don't know whether you've ever been paralyzed or not. Oh, it seems, you see, this, immobile. Can't even turn yourself. Can't feed yourself. Can't bathe yourself. Entirely dependent upon somebody else. The physical body, they, they, I, I don't know, there's something there I can't explain, but it's just a, the, the body is bound. You want it to work, but it won't work. You can't get up and walk. And some way or another, there was a fear that hounded me. Everywhere I went, just like a little dog falling along behind. There was a fear all of those years that was with me that I might become someday, sometime again, bedfast or paralyzed. Some way or another, this fear of paralysis. Immobile. That was a fear. It wasn't in me. It was It was somewhere here like a little dog falling. It'd catch up to me every now and then and I'd resist it and then never to rebuke it and it seemed to stand off out there a few feet away from me but it was ever present with me. But there fell into my hands a book written by a medical doctor, Dr. Lillian B. Yeomans. I was reading. This book fell into my hands and I was reading one night by myself away from home in a revival meeting and I read a chapter on this particular subject about the curse of sickness that sickness is a curse. And Dr. Yeomans asked the question where does sickness come from? If we can find out, you see, we may can stem the flow of sickness and disease. And she made mention of the fact that during World War Number 1, being a medical doctor, even though she was in the healing ministry yet, that she offered her assistance to the United States government. And during World Number War Number 1, that in the west, one of our western states, there came to a mountain community way back up in the Rocky Mountains, a typhoid epidemic. People were dying. People were stricken. So the government sent these company of doctors, four or five of them up there, Dr. Yeomans headed up the company, you see, to stem the tide of typhoid, to keep it from spreading. Well, we got there. Some had already died. They're too late to be ministered to. We ministered to those as best we could. But we know this. If we're going to stem this tide of typhoid fever, this plague, we're going to have to get to the source of it. And being a, a medical doctor and in, a, and in the scientific field, we knew that the first place to look is in the water. So we analyzed the water and found out it was teeming with typhoid germs. Then we asked her, where do you get your water? Well, the way back up in the mountains there, they dug out a cistern. The winter snows would fall, the spring rains would fall, the cistern would fill up with water, and it'd run down, you see, the mountain through the pipe into the little village in the valley. So they dispatched some young men to go and check the source of the water to find out what happened. They drained the cistern and they found out that an old sow pig and ten little pigs had fell into the thing and their flesh had rotted and deteriorated and it had contaminated the water. So they cleaned out the cistern, you see, and stopped, not with medical science, you see, but just finding the source of the thing. Stop the plague. So where does sickness come from? Well, it doesn't come from heaven. There's not any there. It didn't come from God. God's not the author of sickness because when he made man, he didn't make him sick. He saw the work of his hands was good. Man never became sick until after he listened to the devil. Isn't that right? Adam opened the door to the enemy, to Satan. Adam was the God of this world. You see, God said I, to Adam, I give you dominion. He made the earth and so on, the universe, and he said, I give you dominion over all the work of my hand. I'm turning it over to you, he said to Adam. Now, Adam had the legal right. He didn't have the moral right, but he had the legal right to turn it over to the devil. And that's exactly what he did. He committed high treason and turned it over to the devil and the devil became the god of this earth, this world, this present world. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul calls Satan the god of this world. And then it was that man fell heir to sickness. Satan is the author of it. And so, as Dr. Yeomans pointed that out in her book about the curse of sickness, I saw that it was a curse and I saw that it came from hell and not heaven. It came from Satan and not God. I was reading away in the nighttime, way after midnight, about two o'clock the moment. I got so thrilled I couldn't stay in bed. As conservative as I am, I just jumped out of bed and had a running spell. I ran around and 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 around that room. Praise God in my bare feet. Woo! Glory to God. I didn't want to wake up anybody else up in the house and I didn't wake them up, but I just couldn't be still. I'd found out where sickness come from and I just knew then that I'd never be sick anymore because I don't want anything that the devil has. Well, praise God, I got over my running spell. 
I got back in bed and finished the chapter and turned the light out. And just about the time I started to doze off to sleep, just about the time I was just, you know, drifting away, suddenly I came wide awake and on the inside of me in my spirit, I just got so thrilled I couldn't stay in bed. I just turned the light back on and got up and had another running spell. And it just ran and ran and ran around and around and around and around that roof. I was so thrilled with the truth, with the revelation of God's Word. Because the fear was gone. That fear that had followed me like a dog, you know, just dogged my tracks everywhere I went. That fear that was seemed to be back here somewhere. It wasn't on the inside of me in my spirit. Certainly not. But it was there ever present with me, you see, taking advantage of what I didn't know. But that demon of fear said, "Uh uh-oh, he's found out now. And they left and went over to your house. He just left. Praise God, he wasn't there. And it's so good to be free. So after my running spell, I got in bed and turned the light out. Fell off to sleep and slept about an hour because it's about three o'clock in the morning and suddenly I just woke up right. I know what time it was because I turned the light on a few moments and could look at my watch, you see. And, and so I was just a thrill. I couldn't stay in that bed. I couldn't stay in bed. I woke up through, praise God, and turned the light on and had another running spell. That was the third one I had. And then I finally got back in bed and turned the light out and slept another hour and about four o'clock in the morning I suddenly just came wide awake and the first thing I said was I'll never be sick anymore. The Satan is the author of sickness. I sensed that fear is gone. There was no fear in my room. It was gone. I wasn't afraid that it'd ever be paralyzed again. I wasn't afraid that it'd ever be bedfast again. And I got so thrilled I couldn't stay in that bed. Oh, praise God. I turned the light on and jumped up and had another running spell. You know, friends, that's when God's Word works for you. When you get so thrilled with it, you just can't be still. Praise God. Hallelujah. But you see, you preach, I know from experience, you preach these marvelous revelation truths, divine truths, truths of God's eternal word. Because people have been so religiously brainwashed, they'll sit there and look at you like a cow at a new gate. Some of them even chew their cud while they're doing it. And you know it never registered on them. If it had ever registered on them, they couldn't hold the pew. That's all it is to They'd have been as thrilled as I was. But I'll tell you, that's when God's word works for you, when you can get thrilled with it. Jesus' description of the Father here. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen the Father has seen me, has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, Show us the Father? If you want to see God, look at Jesus. Now, Jesus' description of the Father and his statement here, He that has seen me has seen the Father. Let's put it this way. He that has seen me at work sees God at work. For he said, The Father in me, he doeth the works. He said that right there, you see, in this same 14th chapter of John's Gospel. Just read the next verse, the 10th verse. My Father in me, he doeth the works. If you want to see the works of God, if you want to hear the words of God, look at Jesus, listen to Jesus. And I never did hear him one time. When somebody came to him for healing, like the leper said, as Jesus came down off of the mount where he preached a sermon on the mount, and this leper came kneeling down to him and said, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean or whole or heal. And he didn't say, Now, my son, you see, God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. His ways are past finding out. Man in his small, finite mind, you see, could never know, you know, about the infinite. And now God has some purpose in that. You just be patient. Let patience have her perfect work because you see God loves you so much that he sent this on you to deepen your piety and to teach you a good spiritual lesson. So learn your lesson well and it may be eventually that God would heal you if it's his will. I'd just soon hear a donkey bray at midnight and a tin barn. Now I know, I get emotional about this. I'll tell you why, because it almost cost me my life. It almost sent me to a premature grave. I had to find the answers and thank God I found them in his book. No, Jesus never said that one time. And no man and no minister has a right to say it in his name. He said, I will, bless God. That settles it. Jesus is God. He said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And when he healed the leper, he's doing the will of God.
He said, I will be thou clean. Jesus' description of the Father God and his statement here in John 14, 9, He that has seen me has seen the Father makes it impossible for one moment for me to accept the teaching that disease and sickness are of God. The very nature of God refutes the argument because Jesus said, If you want to see God at work, look at me. If you want to know what God's will is, look at me. And he went about doing good because God anointed him to do it. He went about doing good and healing. Healing is good. Now notice, who was it that he healed? Just, well, if it's God's will, he'll heal you. And if it's not, well, he won't. No, he went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil. A-double-L. All. That means all that he healed were oppressed of the devil. Then Satan is the oppressor, but Jesus is the deliverer. And Jesus is the will of God. And Jesus is God at work. For he that seen me has seen the Father. How could anyone doubt? If you want to see God at work, look at Jesus. How could anyone believe that sickness and disease, you see, came from God or from heaven? Well, no, they told me when I was on the bed those years ago. Well, no, maybe God is not. That is, that he just exactly commissioned it all right. Sickness and disease and these things. But now, he permitted it. And they try to look wise about then, you know. Try to get their eyes big, you know, look wise, they say, as an owl. Did you ever study up on that? I always thought, you know, because I'd heard it. See, that's why we believe that we hear him, that an owl's wise. But you know he's not. Study up on it. Get into your encyclopedia and you'll find out an owl's the dumbest bird there. Can't teach him a thing. All he can do is sit around and holler, hoo hoo. A lot of people think they're wise as an owl. They're sitting around perched up in the church, you know. And about all they can do is they can hear a little scandal and they holler, hoo hoo. And they hear some preacher left his wife and they say, hoo hoo. That's all they know. There is one other characteristic about an owl. You can't teach him to do it. He's just born that way. He can sit right still in one position and turn his head around and look right square behind him. And we've got a lot of these old owls perched up in church and they see everything that's going on behind them and a lot that ain't. I was given that illustration one time in a church here in the state of Texas and the pastor said to me, Brother Hagin, you're exactly right. He said, I was born on a farm up here in northeast Texas in Fannin County. And he said, I remember out there on the farm. Now at this time he was talking to me, he was a man up 50 years of age or more around that. But he said, as a little boy, I got a couple of baby owls out in the woods. Brought them in, you know, put them in the barn. And those owls grew up to be grown. One of them, I measured him, one of them, you know, standing, you know, was 40 inches tall and the other 36 inches tall. They lived down the barn. Great big owls, you see. Never could teach them a thing. Never. Tried to never. Only thing they'd ever do, he said, was this. He said, now I would feed them outside the back door of the farmhouse and they'd come up there to eat from the barn. See, because he'd raise them from little baby owls. And they wouldn't eat out of the same pan. You had to have a different pan. You know, he'd get some old pan, you know, that his, of his mother's, you know, cooking utensil that had a hole in it, you know, and mend it some way or another, you know, enough that it needs to put the food in it, you know. They wouldn't eat out of the same pan. I'd have to have one for each one of them. And they'd each one, you see, always eat out of that one. You got a lot of these folks, you know, they got a certain stall. You get in their stall and they're mad about it. <laughs> they wouldn't sit anywhere else to save your life. Getting mad. So and so got my seat. <laughs> And so he said, uh, they, they, and, and, and they wouldn't eat while I was watching them. I, I'd put the food out there, but as long as I stand there, they'd just stand there and stare at me. And I'd have to go back inside, you know, maybe peep out, and then they'd start eating, you know. Only thing he said they'd ever do is this. He said they'd come up there, the pans are empty, I haven't put their food out yet in the morning time, you see. And he said they'd sit there all the time I'm out there and, and put the food in the pan for them. He said they'd sit there and go like this. <laughs> And he said, I don't know why, but when they got through eating, you know, wouldn't eat if I was there. I'd have to go and you know, look around the corner of the house or something. They'd get through eating, you know, and they'd sit there for a few moments and do their head this way. When he said that, I thought, that's exactly the way these owls do. You can come to church and they say, Amen, Amen, and then they go out and live like this. These folks said to me, you know, they tried to look wise as an owl. Well, now, maybe God didn't commission it. Maybe he didn't commission you as a little baby to be born, deformed, and have to die here at 15 years of age, 16. Doctor said it can't live. Have to die, five of them. But now God permitted, and he has, in other words, insinuate, he has because he permitted it, he's got some purpose in it. 
Well, now, wait a minute. That won't bear up. If you want to do it on the way home to church night, God will permit you to stop by and rob a filling station. Warning, if you're pretty good at picking pockets, if you want to do it, he'll permit you to pick somebody's pocket before you get away. I used to could do that. They'd never know. <laughs> I'm not practicing anymore. I could do that. Them people looking right at me. Just pick it up, you know, and walk off with it. Put it in my pocket or something. You know? Well, but he hadn't got any purpose in it. How, why did he permit you to do it? Because you wanted to. He's not trying to work something out. You could have a little child in your home. A little three or four year old child. You see that child just about to put his hand on a hot skillet on the stove. Honey, don't touch that. That'll burn. Well, you happen to turn around to do something else and suddenly you heard the child scream. They put their little hand up on that hot iron skillet. You pull it away and all the skin comes off its hand. Now, don't you misunderstand me at all. That child learned a lesson. That child surely learned not to touch a hot skillet. But that wasn't your way of teaching them. And we may have learned some things, but that wasn't God God's way of teaching us. We had to learn it that way because we're so hard-headed we wouldn't listen to his word to begin with. So don't go off and act sanctimonious and say, well, now God has some purpose in it. Yeah. You permitted that child to touch the stove. Why did you do it? Because you couldn't help it. Why does God permit these things? Because he can't help it. Why can't he help it? Because he made the earth and gave Adam dominion over it and Adam sold out and gave the dominion over to Satan. But he's made provision to redeem us from the hand of the enemy. Praise God. And Jesus said, bless God, that you'll tread on serpents and scorpions. I give you power to tread on scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You see, the, the Bible is progressive revelation. Don't try to get back and live in the Old Testament. That's for spiritually dead people. You're not spiritually dead. You're spiritually alive. Get in the New Testament and live. Jesus plainly taught us that sickness and disease is of the enemy. Luke 13, 16. Ought not this woman to be healed on the Sabbath whom Satan is bound low these 18 years, seeing that She's also daughter of Abraham. Whom did Jesus say bound that woman? Luke 13, 16. He said Satan did. The scripture that I quoted from Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. All that were oppressed of the devil. Mark the 16th chapter. When Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so on. And then he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. And order them was they'll lay hands on the sick and shall recover. Well, you see, he set the church against sickness just like he did against against sin. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, continually cast out demons and broke Satan's dominion over the lives of men and women. There really is no such thing as a separation of disease and sickness from Satan. Disease came with the fall of man. One cannot conceive of sickness in the Garden of Eden before Adam's sin. The fall was of the death. Sickness and sin have the same origin. John Alexander Dowie said, sickness and disease is the foul offspring of its mother's sin and its father's sake. That's as good as any. You see, Jesus' attitude toward sickness was an uncompromising warfare with Satan. His attitude toward sin and his attitude toward sickness was identical. He dealt with sickness as he dealt with demons. Now, I've come to the conclusion, and I think any of us should, if we study our Bibles carefully, that if disease and sickness are of the devil, and they are, then there's only one attitude that the Christian can take in regard to them. That is, we must follow in the footsteps of Jesus and deal with them as he dealt with them. We're just not as Christians supposed to be caught with anything of the devil. It's wrong for us as Christians to have anything that belongs to somebody else. My mother said to me, I remember when I was just a little boy, I wanted to go up the street just a few blocks and play with my cousin Gillis. Now she knew that right next door to my uncle's house was a man by the name of Cameron. And he had out in his backyard some peach trees, fine peaches. He had grown these trees, you know, and grafted them and so on, you know. And people would come on Sunday afternoon from counties around. Drive over there just to drive by and see these fine peaches. She said, a mother knowing boys, about nine years old. Now don't you and Gillis get any of Mr. Cameron's peaches. Oh no, I won't. No. Uh-uh. Well, I went up there to play. And of course, he wanted to. We did climb up on because that ladder there on the garage. See, he couldn't get over the fence. But it just so happened that the one peach tree was close to this garage and there was sort of a side shed to this garage, almost a flat where you'd store tools and lawnmowers and so, you know. And this tree had just grown up over there. And they were some peaches. They're almost sitting in your lap. <laughs> you know, if you were sitting under the limb, I mean, there they were right there. I mean, just right there. 
And I, oh, great big peaches. Beautiful peaches. But I remember Mama said, don't, don't get them. And so I did. Gillis kept trying to talk me in the nose. No, I said, I'm not going to do it. Mama told me not to. And she finds out, she'll give me a whipping. That's what I'll have. Finally, I'd already gotten down off of the garage. And sort of as a last resort, he got two of them. And after he'd already got it, you know, I thought it'd be all right to eat one. After all, I didn't get it. And so I ate the peach. And Gillis ate the other one. Played around for a while and went home. Mama said, son, did you uh, get any of Mr. Cameron's peaches? I said, no, ma'am, I didn't get it. All I did is eat one he got. She said, come here. So I got, went to her, you know, and she picked up my hand and began to smell of them. You know. Said, you've been eating peaches. You've had a peach in your hand. She could smell that peach. Well, I said, now, and now Gillis did get two of them. And then I didn't. I wouldn't do it. I'd already gotten down off of the garage, you see, off of the shed. And then he got these two, all right, and I did eat one. Well, now, she said, just march right in there because I had some money, you know, that I was saving up to buy some clothes with and get a nickel. Now, they don't sound big, but boy, nickel's big in those days. Get a nickel and march right up there and pay Mr. Cameron for that peach. Oh, no, I started crying. Oh, I, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Tell him you got one. I said, I didn't get it. Well, she said, that's the same thing. You knew he did and you ate it. Tell him you got one of his peaches. Don't mention Gillis. That's them for that. But that you ate one of his peaches and pay him for it. Oh, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Well, she went out back out. We had some peach trees. They were scrubby trees. They wasn't you know, having the peaches on them. They did, did the mountain thing, the little bitty thing. But anyway, they made good switches. She got a good one. Now, she said, son, just just, just right up there. I mean, you could look up the street and see it. I mean, there's a house right on the corner, you know, just a couple blocks away. You march right up there and knock on the door and get Give him that nickel. Tell him you got one of his peaches. No, I'm not going to do it. Well, now she said, if you don't, I'm going to give you a whipping. Take you right back there in the bathroom and give you a whipping. And then I'm going to whip you all the way up the street and stand right there with you till you knock on the door and give him the nickel. And then when we get back home, I'm going to take you in the bathroom and give you another whipping. Boy, that'd be three of them. Well, all right, all right. I dried up my tears the best I could and took off up the street. Oh, I was hoping that Mr. Cameron wouldn't be home. Maybe I'd get out of it if he's not home. I knocked on the door, waited a few moments. Almost didn't hear anything, and my heart leaped. I know I thought, sure, maybe he's not home. I hope he's not. And about that time, the door opened. There he was. I mean, he answered the door. And I started to cry again, said, Mr. Cameron, I didn't want to indict or intimidate Gillis. I just said, I ate one of your peaches, and here's a nickel I want to pay for it. Well, I could see he hesitated a moment, and then he understood what was happening, so he took the nickel. Man, that'd just be like a fella taking a $100 bill from you, Dave, or a $500 bill. He took the nickel, and then he said, son, anytime you boys want any peaches to come to see but be glad to give you one. Man, that hurt worse than the whipping. I could have gotten one and not gotten all that trouble. But the thought I wanted to give to you is my mama taught me. It's wrong. It's wrong to take something or to have something that belongs to somebody else. Sickness doesn't belong to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Jesus said when you pray, pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is any sickness in heaven? No. Well, it's not his will then on earth. It's Satan's will. It's a devil's will. It's wrong. To have something that belongs to somebody else. Sickness does not belong to the kingdom of God. Sickness does not belong to heaven. Sickness does not belong to the church of God. Sickness does not belong to the New Testament church. Sickness belongs to the devil. And if you've got a peach and eat it, bless God, just march right back up there and pay for it. That's what you're going to do. And then back off and don't get any more of it. No. You can take sickness and come along, you know, and folks will just open the door and invite it right on in. I mean, good spirit-filled Christians. Come right on in. Yeah, I've been waiting for you. I've been expecting you. They can read in the paper or hear on TV. They told us there's going to be an epidemic of the Asian flu. Now, if they said it's a heavenly flu, I might get ready for it. <laughs> but there, you ever hear of anybody having the heavenly flu? It's always Asian flu, Hong Kong flu. <laughs> Did you ever notice that? It always comes from where the devil and demons and evil spirits are ruling supreme. And spirit-filled Christians will read that and hear it on radio or TV and they'll say, yeah, it's a coming. Yeah, they said it was. I, I, I'll be the first one that'll have it. Yeah, I sure will. And sure enough, they do. They have it. Don't accept it. The Bible said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I don't know what some people are waiting on until they start resisting. I mean, everything that's of the devil, if I resist sickness, I'm resisting the devil. If I resist doubt, I'm resisting the devil. If I resist fear, I'm resisting the devil. If I resist the temptation or the thought to steal, I'm resisting the devil. See, that's what it means to resist the devil. And that's where we make as Christians, we make our mistake. You see, we accept sickness. So like, as somebody put it this way, the, the delivery company, she brings a package to your front door. And they said, well, just sign right there. So you sign for it, pick up the package. 
package, take it in, open it up, said, well, I didn't order that. But now, wait a minute, you've already signed for it. You better not sign for anything. You find out what it is first. But you see, that man's got your receipt for it. You signed for it. And it's difficult to get rid of it now because you've signed for it. That's what happens. The devil comes along, disguised, you see, and brings sickness and disease and headache and asthma and then tuberculosis and cancer and heart trouble and kidney trouble and liver trouble and, and every other kind of trouble. Blood disease and nervous disorder and mental depression. And people sign for it. And then they tell people, yeah, it's mine. Yeah, it's mine. Yeah, it's mine. Yeah, it's mine. I got it. I have it. It's mine. One minister said to me, I was preaching far out here in the state. They said, Brother Hagin, I'm embarrassed. Full gospel pain. I said, embarrassed? What do you mean? Well, he said, you've embarrassed me. I said, I didn't mean to, dear brother. Fine man. Sixty some odd years of age. Been pastor in this church. Built a brand, a church. You see, pioneered. Went into a city here in the state of Texas where there wasn't any kind of full gospel church some 35 years before. And it built it, you see. And pioneered the Pentecostal movement in that city. He said, I'm embarrassed. What are you embarrassed about? Well, he said, Brother Hagin, I got saved. I was already grown and married. See, he's in his 60s now and at about 30 years of age. Got saved, baptized, told little God called and preached. Went to Bible school. He said, you quote Dr. Yeoman, said Dr. Yeoman was 82 years old. And she taught divine healing in our Bible school. See? And said she taught just what you would teach it. And I never got it. I sat there all of that time in Bible school. Till you preached it here 35 years later. I said, that's what she talked about. Preacher, she never got it. He said, I remember, you see, I had a family. So I had to work, support my family, and go to Bible school in the daytime. I had a job. I went to work on it 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He got out of school about 3. Worked 4 o'clock in the afternoon till midnight. 8 hours, see? Go home, you see. Get up and get back to school. And so he said, nighttime working, you know, hot and sweaty, you know, and it had got cold and I didn't have a top coat. And so I took a cold. And I'm sitting there the next morning about half asleep in that class, you know, didn't get a thing hardly, she said. And then I walked up there and said, Dr. Yeoman said, I, I wish you'd pray for my cold. And he said, she said, your cold! She just had a loud booming voice. She, 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 she preached back there before we got these PA systems. She, she, she had, to, had to get loud for people to hear you. She said, she said, your cold, your cold. Well, if it's your cold, it won't be any good to pray for it because you'll still have it. You've already said it's yours. But if you won't get to get rid of the devil's cold, just say so. Well, he said, I do. Said she laid hands on me and almost instantly I was healed and said I never caught on to it till you got to preach it 35 years later.